yeah, so in this paper we want to think about um, uh, monetary policy trade-offs during a situation like the current one, which has been labeled uh, a cost of living uh, crisis. So what we've seen, and we've seen part of this in earlier presentations today as well, we have seen a huge increase in inflation, but importantly, that has been driven by, uh, disproportionately by certain uh, sectors. Uh, think of energy, uh, but to some extent also food, uh, for instance. And these kind of consumption categories, they tend to be uh, a kind of necessity uh, goods in the sense that the poor uh, spend relatively more on those kind of consumption categories, which may make this kind of increase in inflation uh, particularly painful uh, for those at the bottom of the distribution. Uh, so here I'm uh, showing you um, uh, expenditure uh, uh, expenditures on different uh, consumption categories by uh, uh, expenditure deciles, so total expenditure deciles. So you can see that the poorest, they spend uh, relatively more on food, uh, on electricity and gas and so on. And then on the other hand, there are other categories like uh, uh, restaurants and culture on which the uh, rich spend relatively uh, more. Right, so, but if we see this uh, large increase in inflation in these kind of necessity goods, then obviously that's going to have a strong distributional impact, and this is you know, basically what the newspapers are uh, full about uh, these days. All right, so we see that quite clearly here. So these data, by the way, they're all for the United uh, Kingdom, so our current application is to the, is to the UK. Um, so what's shown here is inflation rates uh, by uh, income decile, or by income uh, quartile, I think, quintile. Um, so what we see is that the poorest, they have higher inflation rates exactly because they spend more on those categories that saw the highest, highest uh, increases in, in prices. What's also shown here is a, a prediction for the fall uh, by the Institute for Fiscal Studies in the UK, which suggests that this gap uh, in inflation rates may, uh, may strengthen quite a bit uh, in, the in, the, in the coming months, and it might already have happened to a, to a large extent. Okay, so thinking uh, about this question, so what we want to ask in this paper, uh, how do these sort of specific sectoral shocks that hit particular sectors drive up prices in those sectors um, transmit to the macroeconomy, and also how do they, uh, in sort of equilibrium, affect equilibrium uh, out, uh, distributional outcomes? Right, and we want to think about this in a in a world in which realistically inflation rates vary uh, across uh, households because depending on your consumption basket, your expenditure basket, you'll have a different inflation rate than somebody else. Okay, so now we want to think about monetary policy trade-offs in this uh, kind of uh, situation. Uh, and a key question we want to really ask here is, you know, is this kind of situation, is it different from, say, a, a standard uh, business cycle episode? Right, so is there something special about this kind of situation that makes kind of central bank trade-offs more difficult than during uh, normal times? Right, so what central banks have been quite widely criticized for not hiking up uh, interest rates uh, more aggressively by, by some, but maybe this is just a situation in which the trade-offs are simply more difficult because of the specific uh, sectoral nature of these shocks and also the specific distributional uh, aspects of it. I say we want to get a better sense of what are the trade-offs in this sort of uh, uh, cost of living crisis for monetary uh, policy. Okay, so to this uh, end, we develop a, a model. Um, so it's gonna have three uh, key ingredients that I think are necessary to uh, start thinking about this question. Uh, the first is to have uh, multiple sectors that are heterogeneous, so there may be different supply shocks in different sectors. Um, and second, there will be heterogeneous households. So this will be a Hank, uh, roughly. So this will fall under the wide umbrella of Hank models. Uh, and of course, we want to have this heterogeneity in order to think about this uh, distributional effect. And then third, and that's, I guess, is one of the more uh, important uh, changes relative to the standard uh, uh, model of monetary policy, relative to the standard New Keynesian model, is to relax uh, the preference structure. Uh, so in our standard models of monetary policy, um, the rich may spend, uh, m may spend more than the poor 
and it may react differently to interest rate changes than the poor, but in terms of sort of the composition basket, there are basically scaled up versions of, of poor people. As in, obviously we saw in the data just now uh, that the composition of expenditure baskets is very different for the rich as it is for the poor. Okay, so to this end, we introduce uh, general non homothetic preferences uh, in a model. And in this setting, uh, inflation rates are going to be uh, individual specific, as are by uh, uh, implication real interest rates. And a second, perhaps less obvious uh, aspect of this is that demand elasticities will be heterogeneous um, uh, across households. And this will also be important for monetary policy. I so, um, the fact that consumption baskets are going to be different across different people, that sort of has fairly obvious distributional implications, which will matter for, for, for policy. Uh, the heterogeneity in demand elasticities will um, arguably be uh, as uh, important. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Let me illustrate that here. So this air shaded area shows you uh, a distribution of expenditures um, across the population, so the rich and, and the poor. In our standard models, we assume a so-called constant elasticity of substitution uh, consumption basket, typically, which basically means that everybody is equally sensitive to uh, price changes. And that means that the distribution of expenditure is essentially not important for, um, uh, for kind of the average demand elasticities that firms uh, face. And this demand elasticity in the new Keynesian model is really, uh, is really key because it de de determines uh, directly the markup, and markups are, are central uh, when we think about the transmission of the monetary policy to prices. This is all about how firms set their markups. Now, suppose we're in a world in which uh, demand elasticities are heterogeneous, and empirically, uh, the most reasonable case seems to be that rich people tend to be less price sensitive, so they have lower demand elasticities. Now we can kind of see that the distribution of demand elasticities are going to matter for, for the macroeconomy. I think of you of your being a firm, if you're gonna sell mainly to rich people, they're gonna be uh, less price sensitive. Um, then you're gonna set higher markups than say a firm that sells mainly to poor people. Now of course, as you have these distributional effects over the business cycle, and as this distribution of expenditure kind of changes, uh, this uh, kind of composition of demand elasticities will change uh, as well. And this is gonna have important implications as well. Okay, um, in terms of literature, let me be very brief for the, for the sake of time. But one kind of interesting, I think, um, sort of implication of the model that we'll see soon is that um, usually the household heterogeneity matters for kind of the demand block of the model for Euler equations and budget constraints and so on. Here it will impact directly on the supply block of the model as well, on the so-called New Keynesian Phillips curve, exactly because of this heterogeneity in demand elasticities. Okay, so let me show you uh, the model, and apologies if this is uh, a bit on the, on the, on the, on the technical uh, side of uh, things, uh, but let me try to explain it uh, as simply as I, as I can. So there's going to be heterogeneous households. Um, they, they, they die with a certain probability. They consume a basket of uh, consumption goods from different sectors, so think of it as food, restaurants, and so on. Um, then within each sector, there's a kind of a continuum of varieties, so you have different uh, types of food, and those are going to be symmetric. Now at this point, otherwise we don't make um, uh, strong assumptions on the preference st uh, structure, so we split up, the only thing we do at this point, we kind of split up the utility function in kind of an outer utility function, which controls your consumption basket over um, uh, food, uh, restaurants, furniture, and so on and an inner one which kind of controls your demand elasticity within those uh, sectors. Um, but so this is the point where we usually kind of, um, oh sorry, um, where we usually make, um, oh, can I go back? Ah, sorry, I was clicking through. Uh, yeah, so this is the point where we usually kind of make quite strong assumptions on the, on the preference structure, which we're not, uh, which we're not doing here. Okay, um, so the households are going to be heterogeneous. Uh, here we have permanent income heterogeneity, so some households have, are more productive uh, than others, so they get more income. Um, they own the firms. For now, we assume that kind of firm ownership is proportional to their labor income. This is something we can relax quite easily. 
So here we see the budget constraint of the households, uh, which is kind of standard. The, the main thing is that now households consume goods from all these different sectors, uh, which may all have uh, different prices. Okay, so this is kind of the simple baseline model. We're working on a, a whole number of extensions, for instance, to include hand-to-mouth uh, households, uh, richer heterogeneity in firm ownership, uh, sectoral wage heterogeneity, a fiscal policy, of course, uh, will be important in this model as well. Okay, so now to give you a sense of sort of how this, diff this model is kind of uh, different, sort of what makes it tick, it's kind of useful to look at a couple of kind of sufficient statistics uh, at, the, at the household level. I so understand that the heterogeneous agent model, a key statistic uh, we, we focus on, thanks to the, thanks, uh, to the work of, of Gianluca, is the marginal propensity uh, to consume. Now here with this heterogeneity in consumption baskets and demand elasticity, there are going to be uh, additional uh, statistics that are going to be important. In particular, the demand elasticity, of course, but it's going to be uh, varying across households. There's a super elasticity, kind of how your demand elasticity changes with, uh, with the price. Across price elasticity, it's like if uh, prices in energy go up, how am I going to adjust my food consumption, for instance? There are budget shares, and then finally, what's also an important statistic here is the marginal budget share. So if I get to, say, spend another euro, how am I going to, at the margin, allocate that euro over different consumption goods? That's, that's what that is. Okay, so on the firm side, things are fairly standard. They operate a linear uh, production technology, but we allow for sectoral shocks. So we can kind of think of the food sector or the energy sh sector being hit by uh, particular uh, shocks. Firms are monopolistically competitive uh, and they face uh, a rigidity in price adjustments and here we follow the standard Calvo setup that you can uh, adjust your price only with a certain probability. So this part of the model is all completely standard, except that firms now face this sort of much richer demand uh, curve where they care very much about who they're selling to because that, that de de determines uh, the demand elasticity of the households. Okay, um, then uh, there's a government. Um, here, we're not looking much at fiscal policy. It eliminates steady state markups because we want to ultimately move to uh, optimal policy, but this is not important. The central bank follows an interest rate rule. Now here, it's not ent entirely clear what um, uh, inflation index the central bank should use because different households have different relevant uh, inflation indices that are all individual. For now, we're going to keep it kind of positive, and given that we apply the model to the, to the UK, we, uh, we uh, specify policy in terms of the CPI inflation index, which is ingrained in the mandate of the, the Bank of England. Um, but we also consider other uh, indices. Uh, let me not delve into that too much here. Okay, so now we can see how this model is going to be uh, uh, different from, from our standard New Keynesian model, uh, for, the, for those who are familiar uh, with it. Um, so there's a fairly huge amount of algebra underlying this, but ultimately we get to an equation which is uh, hopefully familiar. So on the left-hand side, we have inflation in a particular sector. On the right-hand side, we have uh, discounted expected inflation uh, tomorrow. So this is how expectations matter. This is all standard. And then the second line here is um, uh, essentially the uh, marginal cost times a slope of the Phillips curve. So this lambda, that's the slope of the, of the Phillips curve here. Okay, so what are these terms in that marginal cost uh, term? So first of all, we have the output gap. So in the standard setting, uh, that would be the only uh, term that, that enters. So Y minus Y star is a deviation of a demand index from its, steady, from its flexible price version. But now in addition, there are other terms. Uh, one relates to heterogeneity in prices across sectors, and the other relates to heterogeneity in productivity across sectors. Say, if I'm in a sector that's just been hit with a negative productivity shock, then my marginal cost is higher, so I'm going to pass that on to, uh, to consumers. Uh, so these, these are kind of the, um, the terms you get from just mul having multiple sectors. Then finally, and this is, I think, this is the most interesting part, we get uh, another term, this uh, red M, which we call the endogenous markup uh, wedge. Now, in our models, when we think about uh, optimal policy, we often kind of stick this kind of wedge in exogenously in order to kind of make the policy trade-offs a bit more interestingly interesting, but here it's, it really arises endogenously and it captures 
variation in this distribution of, uh, of demand uh, elasticities. I also say, for instance, the economy is going to be hit by a, a negative shock. People cut back on their expenditure. As their expenditure falls, they might become more price, uh, price sensitive so that demand elasticity falls on average. So uh, therefore, markups are going to, uh, are going to be uh, pushed, pushed down. So that's what this M captures. Now, in principle, this M is quite a, a kind of complicated uh, distributional object, but it turns out that we can, uh, can characterize that uh, analytically. Essentially, it consists of two terms. Term one is kind of how your, mar or how your demand elasticity varies with your level of expenditures. Um, and the second captures kind of uh, switching in expenditures between different sectors. Say, if relative prices in some sector uh, increases, then uh, I might switch to, to other sectors. Now, importantly, once we have standard preferences, uh, we can show that this entire wedge um, uh, disappears. So it really comes from this non-homothetic uh, uh, preferences. Okay, so in terms of the model uh, solution, this turns out to be uh, actually quite easy model to solve, even though there is this, a lot of this uh, distributional dynamics going on, which actually matters. Uh, but we can linearize the model, uh, and this gives us basically a set of uh, four equations per sector, which we can use to uh, solve with uh, standard models. Um, and then we can also solve for the entire uh, distribution in a fairly straightforward way. So those interested in, in, in this kind of model uh, might find that interesting. Okay, so now let me show you what kind of uh, implications this has for monetary policy. So we see that relative to the kind of uh, standard uh, New Keynesian Phillips curve, and this is just a one sector simplified example, there's two things that are different. One is that the slope of the New Keynesian Phillips curve becomes different. And the other thing is that we have this wedge. Right, so the slope uh, becomes different because with uh, non-homostatic preferences, non-CES preferences, you get limited pass-through. That's this first term. And then the second term is this um, uh, markup wedge that I was just uh, talking about. Now, importantly, both these terms, these red terms, they depend on the distribution of factors. So if we say we go to a more unequal society, then those, uh, those two terms will change. So here the heterogeneity really directly impacts on the, um, on the supply side uh, of the model. And they, but they work interestingly in kind of two uh, opposite directions. Like on the one hand, from this first term, we typically would get under reasonable parameterizations of flattening of the Phillips curve because there's now limited pass-through of uh, marginal costs to prices. On the other hand, this wedge kind of uh, uh, increases uh, the slope of the Phillips curve, at least with respect to, uh, to, to output, uh, because if we go into a, a recession, for people cut their expenditures, uh, demand elasticities go down, so markups uh, go down as well. Now, in terms of uh, optimal trade-offs, this has important implications for central banks because it basically means that it's no longer possible due to that wedge to stabilize both the output gap and inflation at the same time. It breaks what we call the divine coincidence. So now, naturally, there's going to be a trade-off between uh, uh, output uh, gap and uh, inflation. And this, this creates... Uh, uh, kind of a trade-off for the, for the central bank that we, that we wouldn't uh, otherwise uh, have. Okay, so we apply the model to the uh, UK. Let me, um, so these are the, sorry, um, these are the estimated preferences. So we have basically fit angle curves uh, into the model. We do that using uh, micro data uh, on consumption expenditures. And in fact, one nice aspect of this model is, is that we can directly feed the distribution of consumption expenditures into the model. So I say if our uh, survey has, say, a single mother in uh, Blackpool, say, uh, who happens to have uh, a, a large poorly insulated house but spends a lot of an en on, on energy, we can actually just simulate the effect of a monetary policy shock on that uh, particular uh, person. We can sort of directly feed the data into the, into the model. So this is the um, distribution of demand elasticities. Uh, sorry, and we see that these distributions, they vary quite a bit uh, uh, across sectors according to our uh, estimation. Okay, um, so let me now look at some uh, of these central bank trade-offs. So first I want to look at an aggregate productivity shock. So suppose aggregate productivity falls in all sectors. 
Um, output, or Y, goes down, as you would expect. However, the output gap goes up because firms do not cut their prices as much as they would have with flexible prices. So you actually get an increase in, in the output gap. This is a, a standard uh, result. Inflation uh, in CPI goes up. But interestingly, if you look at the, bottom, uh, at the middle um, panel on the bottom row, then we see that uh, the shock has heterogeneous effects on inflation in different sectors, and particularly sort of necessity goods like food and, and clothing tend to be hit more by the aggregate shock uh, than, than the other goods. So this is going to have direct distributional consequences, even though this is just an aggregate uh, shock. So now we can next uh, kind of decompose, um, oops, um, sorry. Um, Can I go back to the, uh, so, uh, somehow I got out of it. Um, ah, sorry, I'm really struggling with this clicker here. Um, yeah, so this is the one I wanted to show. So CPI inflation goes up, obviously, after a negative productivity shock because cost increase. Here I'm decomposing that increase using the Phillips curve, and what we see is that that endogenous market breadth that I was emphasizing, that's the green line, actually contributes quite a bit in the sense that it depresses uh, uh, the increase uh, in inflation substantially. Uh, so this endogenous market breadth sort of quantitatively actually uh, matters quite a bit uh, in, this, uh, in this model. Okay, so here I'm comparing the model uh, to alternative versions. The blue version, which is probably the more interesting version, would be the, the version with standard CES preferences. And then what we see is that with standard preferences, the, um, the output gap would, um, would increase much uh, less than in our uh, baseline model. So again, we see that uh, having these non-homothetic preferences in a model really, really uh, matters in this, in this setting. So here we're looking at the monetary policy shock. Again, a monetary policy shock will have different effects on inflation in different sectors. Uh, here, transport actually falls the most. So again, this is going to be a distributional channel of monetary policy, right? Because people have different consumption baskets, so the monetary policy shock will have direct distributional implications through that, uh, through that, through that effect uh, immediately. Following the monetary policy shock, uh, outputs uh, falls. Uh, the output gap falls too, of course. Interest rates increase, so we're looking at a, a monetary tightening here. Now what's sort of interesting here is that when we look at the CPI, uh, the CPI falls, of course, after monetary tightening, but uh, the market price hardly reacts. So that suggests that monetary policy, unfortunately, might have very little uh, power uh, in terms of kind of controlling that wedge uh, in, in the equation. All right, so here I'm looking at the uh, um, again at the model, but now versus uh, a version with uh, standard preferences. So again, if we compare the blue line to the black line, what we now see is that um, in our baseline model, the black line, the output gap reacts much more strongly on impact to uh, a monetary policy shock, whereas inflation uh, falls less. So essentially what this means is that the, uh, the effect here is that the, uh, that dominates is that the new new Keynesian Phillips curve is flatter here. So we get bigger effects of monetary policy shocks on quantities and smaller effects on uh, prices. Okay, so now kind of coming back to the big picture motivation. So is this kind of situation that we're in now different from uh, a usual situations in terms of trade-off? I'm looking here not just at these aggregate shocks, so the monetary policy shock and a, a productivity shock, but also at shocks to productivity in individual sectors. So those are the other panels here. What's plotted here is the CPI inflation again, so that's the, um, the, the black line. And I'm also plotting the output gap. Right, so these are typically two objects that the central bank would care about. Now if we look at these two aggregate shocks, then they move in the same direction, for instance, uh, following a productivity uh, shock. So that means that if you say you tighten policy, you would kind of move both in the same direction. So there's not much of a trade-off. But for certain other sectors, like food, we see that following a negative uh, price sh uh, productivity shock to food, so food prices increase, 
the out aggregate output gap actually falls. So now we have a, a trade-off. You can either try to uh, kind of limit uh, this increase in food prices, but the downside of that would be that you would depress the economy, you push down uh, the output gap. So now there's a clear trade-off. So indeed, following these sectoral shocks, these uh, central bank trade-offs seem to be potentially a lot trickier, and it's not that obvious uh, whether you want to increase or, uh, or decrease the, um, uh, the interest rate in that situation. And that becomes even trickier once we start thinking about distributional effects. So what I'm showing you here is the um, uh, consumption response by uh, decile. So the blue line are the poorest households, the rich line, uh, the red line are the richest households. For aggregate shocks, these are kind of similar, although monetary policy shocks tend to, uh, tightening tend to hit the poor a bit more than, than the rich. But for these sectoral shocks, these differences are much, much bigger. For instance, an increase in food prices will hit the poor uh, much more than it hits the rich. Right? And of course, for other sectors, uh, that's, that's, that's the opposite. For instance, uh, let's say uh, restaurants and, and, uh, and hotels, it will be the opposite. Uh, so again, also in terms of these distributional impacts, the uh, um, uh, cost of living crisis, like these sectoral shocks, are much more difficult to deal with than, uh, than aggregate uh, shocks. Okay, so now the final thing we do, and um, I'll keep it short because this part is, is really still a bit uh, preliminary, is uh, look at uh, the recent years in the UK. So what we do essentially is something similar to uh, Gianluca. We invert the model and we back out shocks such that we match exactly uh, the uh, uh, price indices in the various sectors that we have in the model. And then we do a counterfactual in which uh, policy would be much more uh, aggressive. That's the, that counterfactual is the, is the red line. And then what you see is that um, the output gap, which increases uh, following the shocks, could have been pushed down a bit um, uh, by being more aggressive. And inflation could have been pushed down a lot more by being more aggressive. However, when we think about, when we look at the current situation, then we see that according to the model, the current output gap is actually already negative. So if we would have tightened further, then we might have pushed down inflation even further but that would have come uh, at the expense of, uh, of a negative output gap. So indeed, we now seem to be in this kind of situation where there, where there really is this trade-off, even setting aside the distributional considerations that a tightening in monetary policy will likely kind of be an additional uh, uh, painful experience for the poor. All right, um, that uh, was it. So we developed this multi-sector uh, hang models um, for those interests, computationally, it's, it's actually very uh, easy to uh, solve. Um, the key thing here is that heterogeneity matters not just for the demand side of the, of the model, but also directly for the supply side. Um, and that, most importantly, these sectoral shocks are really different from, from aggregate shocks. We get much stronger trade-offs in terms of output versus uh, inflation, and also in terms of distributional. Uh, dynamics. Okay, so now in, in, follow, in the following work, we'd like to work out what is actually the optimal uh, uh, policy in this kind of scenario, uh, and we're, we're working hard to, uh, to kind of get there.